Desmond, thanks for joining us. Well, the coronavirus is back again with a new strain, and it's prompting travel bans, border closing. The Omicron variant emerged from South Africa, and scientists are concerned it could be highly transmissible. There are very few cases of Omicron, and researchers know very little about it. So are world leaders overreacting? Dale Hurd has the latest. The World Health Organization calls Omicron a variant of concern, but admits more needs to be learned about it. Initial reports describe it as having very mild symptoms. But the virus may also be highly transmissible. Two new cases have just been confirmed in Canada, the first known to have reached North America. It does appear, again, very preliminary evidence that it is more transmissible. We don't know for sure. We really have no data on severity, whether it's as severe, light, milder, or more significant. The United States has decided to ban travelers from South Africa and seven other countries in the region. Israel has closed its borders to non-citizens for two weeks and has authorized cell phone surveillance of anyone confirmed to be carrying the variant. Japan also closed its borders to foreign visitors. But the head of the South African Medical Association, Dr. Angelique Coetzee, said Western nations are panicking unnecessarily. This body aches and pain with a bit of a headache. Not really a sore throat, more a scratchy type of description, and no cough and no loss of smell or um, taste. And that is what we call mild symptoms. South Africa's health minister slammed what he called the draconian travel bans. The reaction of uh, some of uh, uh, countries in terms of uh, imposing uh, travel bans and, 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 and such measures are completely against the norms and standards as guided by the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization has called for international borders to remain open. Former FDA commissioner and Pfizer board member Dr. Scott Gottlieb told CBS that yes, Omicron seems to be highly transmissible, but world leaders shouldn't have panicked and their actions may discourage other nations from reporting new variants. It has a lot of mutations that we know correlate with escape from immunity that's conferred by prior infection or by the vaccines. But we didn't need to close off travel, and unfortunately, we're punishing South Africa for doing the right thing. Health officials say more data is needed to determine if vaccines are effective against the Omicron variant, which is most likely already in the United States, although so far no cases have been reported. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, unless you're going to ban all travel, uh, a travel ban for particular countries isn't going to work because people get to go to another country and then from that other country uh, they get to transmit the, the virus. We've already seen that. It's already in Canada, so it's just a matter of time before it gets here. And now the issue is how severe is it? How severe are the symptoms? Uh, how transmissible is it? Uh, and then how quickly can Pfizer and Moderna come up with a new vaccination? Uh, they're already talking about 120 days, 100 days, 90 days. There are a lot of different time frames uh, being bandied about. They need a variety of that virus in order to uh, effectively come up with a vaccine. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we're, we're, we get to have the, the scare, and is there going to be yet another wave of contagion? Are we going to be into uh, more lockdowns and, and mandatory masks and all of the other things associated with it? And this goes along with what the CDC said months ago, and this is all the way back. If you can imagine a time where we didn't have COVID all around us, uh, they predicted that there were going to be waves of contagion. And the reason is it's a novel virus and that's a coronavirus. And so coronaviruses are notorious for mutation. And because it's a brand new virus that human beings haven't seen before, we don't have a natural immunity to it. And so you're going to see viral blooms and waves of contagion. So this was predicted by the CDC. Now the issue is how do we react and do we initially overreact? I would say yes. Uh, when the stock market sells off by 900 points in one day uh, and a half day of trading at that, that's, that, that could be an overreaction. 
How, how are we going to deal with it going forward? Well, we, we're going to trust in the vaccination process, and can that work? And can we trust in our natural immunity? Can we do our best to stay away from uh, infection and, and any kind of source of infection? The answer is yes, we can do all of these things. And at the same time, realize coming together is the way forward. How do we have agreement? This virus seems to be dividing us uh, and it seems to be coming quite a political issue as opposed to a medical issue. Well, in other news, the holiday season marks a new kind of crime hitting America's cities. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That is right, Gordon. The smash and grab attacks targeted stores on Black Friday and over the weekend. Flash mobs overwhelmed workers rushing in and looting stores. California police reported a rash of similar robberies, including tens of thousands of dollars in merchandise stolen from a Nordstrom department store. In one incident, the mob reportedly used a chemical agent against a store employee. Chicago media report at least four smash and grab robbery, robberies and two Best Buys were hit in Minnesota. Retailers are working with lawmakers to make it harder to resell stolen goods online. Well, today is Cyber Monday and retailers are anticipating record online sales. Americans expected to spend up to $11.3 billion on the web, despite concerns of supply chain issues holding up deliveries. For the first time ever, online shopping decreased on Black Friday as more shoppers returned to stores. Retail Next, a company that tracks shoppers, reports foot traffic was up 61% over last year, but down 27% from 2019. Well, online freedom of speech is at the heart of heated opposition to President Biden's pick to head the Federal Communications Commission. As CBN senior Washington correspondent Tara Merchant reports, Republicans say the nominee wants to silence conservative voices. The White House calls Gigi Sohn a leading advocate for open and affordable communications networks that promote democracy. Conservative opposition, however, may delay acting on the nomination and keep the panel from having a Democrat majority. While the White House states Gigi has worked to defend and preserve the fundamental competition and innovation policies that have made broadband Internet access more ubiquitous, competitive, affordable, open and protective of user privacy, critics call President Biden's FCC nomination his most dangerous yet. Her name is Gigi Sohn. How petrified should every American be about her nomination? The FCC wields extensive authority over broadband providers, wireless companies, and broadcasters. Sohn, a communications attorney, is one of two progressive picks for the agency and a longtime supporter of net neutrality. 96% of residential high-speed broadband internet lines in this country are owned either by a cable company or a telephone company. She previously served under Barack Obama as an architect of the commission's 2015 net neutrality order, gutted by a Republican-led FCC two years later. Now, everybody likes net neutrality, but what they don't like is the FCC's ability to be a referee on the field and make sure that networks are fast, fair, and open. She's also hinted at deploying the agency's regulatory power to censor conservative media and revive a version of its mooted fairness doctrine. Republicans, including Senator Lindsey Graham, blasting the nomination on Twitter. GOP critics also point to numerous statements they say are red flags she'll censor conservative media, including this one. For all my concerns about Facebook, I believe that Fox News has had the most negative impact on our democracy. It's state-sponsored propaganda, with few, if any, opposing viewpoints. And after Tribune Broadcasting abandoned its merger with right-leaning Sinclair Broadcast Group in 2018, she said, Today is a good day for every American who believes that diversity of voices in the media is better for our democracy and that the FCC should look at whether Sinclair is qualified to be a broadcast licensee at all. She will go after the licenses of Fox News, of Sinclair, of anybody who disagrees with the Biden administration. Currently, the FCC is deadlocked in a partisan 2-2 tie, rendering it politically hamstrung. Sohn's nomination comes alongside that of FCC acting chair Jessica Rosenworcel. 
Their confirmations would help President Biden spend billions to expand high-speed broadband in his infrastructure package. In Washington, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Thank you, Tara. Well, staying right here in Washington, an important moment at the White House last night as American Jews celebrated Hanukkah by lighting the national menorah on the first night of the eight-day celebration. Second gentleman Douglas Enhoff, Vice President Kamal Harris's Jewish husband, was on hand for the lighting ceremony. Well, in Israel, archaeologists claim new discoveries back up the key event behind Hanukkah celebrations. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports on the historical evidence of a Jewish victory over Greek rulers. More than 2,000 years ago, this hilltop fortress, with its commanding view, was supposed to protect the city of Marasha, ruled by the Greeks, from a legendary Jewish revolt. But it didn't work. In the Lachish Forest, archaeologists say they have evidence of the Hasmonean Jewish victory over the Seleucid Greek rulers, despite Seleucid attempts to fortify and protect this encampment against attacks. What we discovered here actually connects with the story of Hanukkah and the Hasmonean revolt against the Greeks. The excavation revealed a well-fortified 50-foot by 50-foot building that had been destroyed. Excavation director Aki Noah Montague says they uncovered the walls of the structure, which were nearly 10 feet wide and sloped to prevent invaders from scaling the wall. We also uncovered the structure layer, which in it we found hundreds of artifacts, including pottery and coins and weapons, which we dated back to the second uh, century BC. We believe that the destruction was done by the Hasmoneans as part of their conquest of Edomea in 112 BC. The structure was about 16 feet tall, with seven rooms and a stairwell leading to a second floor. The structure layer was about half a meter, and here we have the wood blocks from the roof. We believed that the roof collapsed, and on the roof, the rest of the walls in the building. During the excavations, we took out hundreds of stones until we reached the destruction layer. The Hasmonean Jews were descendants of the legendary Maccabee family that rose up against the idol-worshipping Greek Seleucid rulers of the day. After the revolt, they cleansed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and thus the holiday of Hanukkah was born. According to the story, they found enough oil to burn in the menorah for one day. But miraculously, it burned for eight days. Here, some 40 miles from the Temple Mount, the Hasmoneans were also victorious. We know the story is the, the, Jews, the Jews against the Greeks, and this is just the proof of that happening. The site was full of treasures. These are some of the artifacts we found. All these uh, small jugs were used to hold mainly uh, expensive materials, such as oils or perfumes. Today, we excavated this bronze pin, which was used to hold up the piece of clothing they were wearing at the time. High school students helping in the excavation are also learning important skills and connecting with their past as part of a program called Eretz Israel, or Land of Israel Studies. They arrive the first day, they have no idea what they're doing, and after a few days they, they come and tell me what they found and they can explain to me everything. So seeing them actually learn through the process of digging and touching the history and making history by digging the site. They were touched by their experience. From reading it in the book, it's made it's make it like alive. We see it in our eyes, we touch it. It's not something we heard in the school. It's a true story that we touch for real. We're really digging up the history that we're living it now and celebrating Hanukkah now. While this area will eventually be open for the public, experts say the most exciting part is how the excavation breathes life into history from 2,000 years ago. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Bringing history to life. Thank you, Chris. Well, families in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia got a real treat last night. The grand illumination at the Founders Inn. With the flick of a switch, thousands of lights brightened the night sky, and it kicked off the Christmas season on the CBN and Regent Campus. Ashley Key has some of this year's highlights. about you, but I love the Christmas season, spending time with family and friends and all of the fun activities. And I especially love the festivities at the Founders Inn Grand Illumination. Right away, I knew that Grand Illumination 2021 would not disappoint. Seeing the excitement of all the kids and the families that are here. And let's take a look at this Christmas tree. I mean, it's going from the ceiling to the sky. And that makes me wonder, um, did you guys help decorate this tree? I mean, you're so tall. Well, that tree is a little bigger than we are even. That's true, that's true. It's so fun. 
an old place to go. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. The sound of carolers and the clip-clop of horse-drawn carriages beckon to all. Come aboard, be transported back in time. There's even a place where kids can go wild with paint, at least on their faces. Everyone was captivated by the aerial artistry of trapeze performers without even going to the circus. Later, the children settled down to hear the Christmas story, read by Terry Mewson. An angel to the town of Nazareth to Galilee. Then, off to the grand finale. Are you ready for the lights? Okay, here we go. You ready? Three, two, one. For the dazzling grand illumination, 100,000 twinkling lights that turned the CBN campus into a winter wonderland. The CBN and Founders Inn families wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas. Just beautiful. Gordon, looks like the Christmas spirit hit the CBN campus. Well, we do like to celebrate Christmas around here. And uh, looking at that Christmas tree at Founders Inn, uh, that was a work of art my mother put together. She, she picked all of those angels to go around it. There are a lot of activities for you to enjoy. Uh, at Founders Inn on the CBN campus, all you have to do is go to our website. And if you want to be part of a teddy bear tea, uh, <laughs> breakfast with Santa, that'd be nice. Uh, holiday brunch, we've got a whole lot more. And then we have all the lights. The whole campus is lit up, CBN and Regent Campus. And you can get to get a carriage ride around if you want. So. For more information, all you have to do is go to CBN.com. And Terry was there. She read the Christmas story. It was a remarkable night, really. I mean, it's so beautiful. You know, the campus is already beautiful, but at night you don't really see all of that. And when you hit that button and those lights come on, I mean, the cheer rises from the crowd and the whole place is magical. It's beautiful. Yeah. And you're coming back tonight. I, I'm coming for a carriage ride. All right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, with Thanksgiving behind us, and that would be in more ways than one, the Christmas season is now in full swing. From trimming the tree to baking cookies to singing Christmas carols, we all have our favorite traditions that come with the season. And behind every tradition is a story. And with the Fox News family, there's a whole book of them. CBN's Jenna Browder explains. We all have our favorite Christmas traditions and stories, and now there might be a few new ones for you to tear out of this new book. It's serious and it's fun, and, and again, you get to know people in a different way when you see how they actually celebrate um, Christmas. All American Christmas, stories and traditions of the Fox News family. From the snowy ranges of Wyoming, where Dana Perino spent her earliest holidays, to the Florida beaches of Shannon Bream's childhood. Each chapter is a snapshot into the gifts they loved, the foods they ate, and the people and places that mattered most. We really are Christmas people, so it made sense for us to do the book. All compiled by Rachel Campos Duffy and Sean Duffy. For us, we thought, isn't it great to take other people's stories of of how they celebrated Christmas when they were little, how they celebrate it now. What we love about our Christmas is that we both come from very different traditions. Starting with the tree, Rachel, who came from a military family, grew up with fake Christmas trees, a much different experience than her husband, who grew up in rustic Wisconsin. Well, I was like, who doesn't cut down their Christmas tree? <laughs> you have a fake Christmas tree in your house? Um, that's sinful. So that was one of our traditions that, that I Rachel love that has about Wisconsin. Into. And so, so now um, we take our kids out every year. We have nine kids. We take them out. Um, and it's, our, it's usually after Thanksgiving. Uh, one, whether it's a week or, or two, we'll go get our Christmas tree. And it's a big um, celebration for our family as we kick off. Christmas. The Duffies highlight all of their favorite traditions. Another comes first thing Christmas morning. Before racing down to open all of their presents, the family sings Away in a Manger. I'll just say about singing Away in a Manger, this was a tradition that came from my husband's family. But I, to me, I, I love it. It's like that last bit of anticipation. But it's also the last chance that we have before the gifts to remind our kids of what Christmas is really about. For them, Jesus in the manger is the reason for the season. 
for us, it's what it's all about. Now, in our book, we talk about other people who are friends of ours at Fox News who have different traditions. Some of them are from mixed Jewish and Christian heritages, and they have to mix all these things. We're both Catholic. I'm Hispanic Catholic. He's Irish Catholic. And so the beauty of that is that we as a family are very intentional about it. It's very important to us. They say the book and some of the personal stories will have you tearing up in one chapter. I loved hearing their stories. I mean, John Roberts is somebody we see. He's a very serious newsman. Um, his story about losing his dad when he was six, just before the holidays, and just sort of how that colored, not just that Christmas, but so many of the other Christmases. Indeed, he says that the, the merrier the Christmas, the more he can contrast it and appreciate it. And laughing in the next. And we actually started crying during Jesse Waters sent us his submission, his story. And uh, we cried laughing, laughing Jesse. Right. Was was gonna say. I was going to so say. <laughs> his family went from New York, I think New York, up to Pennsylvania to cut down a Christmas tree. They netted it, right? Put it on the top of the station wagon, drove home put it in the stand, unedited it, went to bed, and he said they woke up at like four in the morning and the cat was going crazy in the house. They actually said they had a squirrel that came out of the tree and the cat was going nuts, tearing up the house. Literally, this is out of a movie. So from the Duffies and the rest of the Fox News family. And outside of your network and our network, there's not a lot of people saying Merry Christmas. So exactly. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> And the book also includes some recipes. There's a sister's favorite Chex Mix and a family secret punch, just to name a few. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, that's a look at Fox News and their Christmas traditions. I like the caption on one of those photos. Uh, a foot soldier in the war on Christmas, and he's all decked out. Well, the book is called An All-American Christmas, and you can find it wherever books are sold. Well, Giving Tuesday is tomorrow, November 30th, and we're inviting you to do something life-changing for people in need. This is your opportunity to give to hurting and needy, needy people as a way to say thanks for all the blessings we all enjoy. When you give between now and Giving Tuesday, your gifts will be matched by existing CBN donors up to a limit of $100,000. So even more people will receive food, clean water, education, medical help, and you'll help us broadcast the gospel around the world. To give, all you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit CBN.com. Well, John Archer already had three strikes against him. He was diabetic, he was overweight, and he had high blood pressure. So after John was hospitalized with COVID-19, doctors warned his family if he didn't improve in 48 hours, he might not survive at all. You just wonder if he's going to die, and what am I going to do if he does that? And how am I going to make it? He's my partner. We've been together since I was 18 years old. So we just didn't want him to die. The COVID test was positive for 65-year-old John Archer. John received an antibody infusion to help him fight off the virus and was sent home. A few days later, Peggy, his wife of 46 years, noticed he was sluggish and slurring his words. I was a little concerned. We had ordered one of the oxygen level indicators, and when I tested his oxygen, it was in the 70s. At their daughter Heather's urging, Peggy drove John, a type 2 diabetic, to the emergency room at nearby Norton Brownsboro Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. Heather and her fiance, Scott, met them there. What the doctors were telling us was the sickest patients that they had seen were people that were diabetic, had high blood pressure, and were overweight. And here he was with all these risk factors. Even more alarming, John's blood sugar level was 1,250 when it should have been under 150. Literally, when we dropped him off in the emergency room, we didn't know if we were going to see him again. So it was really scary and really emotional. And we started right away praying and started calling our people to pray. Making it even more heart-wrenching, it was the same hospital where Heather lost her husband to cancer six years before. We were in the same ER. He was moved to the same floor. And it's hard not to think about that when someone 38 years old dies. Now in the ICU, John's heartbeat was irregular and doctors were concerned about permanent damage. 
His oxygen levels were still dangerously low. John's doctors called Peggy, who was quarantined at home, and got her permission to put him on a ventilator. And they were like, that's his best chance at survival is if we put him on a vent. Of course, she just automatically go to the worst case scenario because the percentage of people that get off of it is very low. We were obviously like very, very frightened to hear that. The next day, Heather, Scott, and the Archer's church family met outside the hospital to pray, while Peggy and their son Craig joined in through FaceTime. It was freezing cold, and they just prayed for my dad, and it was so powerful and just so sweet. They came together and prayed for him when he couldn't do that for himself. Peggy would need those prayers as well. John's doctors told her if he didn't improve within 48 hours, he might not survive. I was very anxious, pacing the floor, waiting to hear an update. I wanted to know that something had improved. I felt like people were holding my hands up and helping me to pray and reaching out to God for a miracle. In those critical hours, people continue to pray as doctors work to stabilize John's blood sugar, heart, and oxygen levels. Then two days later, on Tuesday, February 2nd, the family got some good news. They said he was improving. Uh, they said that his um, sugar levels had come down way, way, way down, and that um, his heart damage was minimal. And so we were just grateful for that. However, John was still intubated. So his family continued to pray that he could come off the vent successfully without damage to his heart. We were not quite out of the woods yet. You're just cautiously optimistic. You're not totally relieved yet because he's not off the vent yet. Heather sent out updates on social media, asking people to intercede in prayer. We didn't want his heart rate to ramp up. That was one of the things I specifically asked for people to pray for you know, that, that he would stay calm when they did take him off the vent. On February 6th, one week after he was hospitalized, John was able to come off the vent. Heather recalls getting the news from the nurse. When she called after they extubated him, he was calm. And I thought that was so awesome that God answered that prayer so specifically. They held the phone up to his ear so we could hear his voice and he could hear our voice. John was still weak and a little confused. The next day, however, Peggy got a phone call. She answered the phone and I said, hi, honey, it's Lazarus. <laughs> and uh, she said, John, you know. I'll never forget the look on her face. It was just amazing. <laughs> and we were able to talk to him for a few moments and that was like the best. <laughs> that was the best day. It was the sweetest moment that you could imagine. We were just so excited. We definitely knew he was gonna be okay after he called. After two weeks of rehab, John came home. Now he's back to work and enjoying time with his family. The archers believe that without prayer, John's outcome would have been very different. Prayer is what saved him. God worked through the doctors and the nurses, but it's because of the prayer of others, you know, and our prayers. I think God just, knew we just, he had to help us. Prayer is a huge part of, of why he's still here. God's always faithful and he's always with us. Prayer um, is, is your best weapon against Satan's plans for you. God listens to your prayers. We're just regular people that got a miracle of healing. And we are grateful for that every day. God loves regular people. <laughs> We're all just regular people. We're all beggars looking for bread. And the bread of life is in our God, who is a healer, a mighty healer, who hears our prayers and who responds to us with love and mercy and grace. We've got some more amazing stories here, though John's is pretty wonderful. I mean, talk about a great phone call. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. that's <laughs> oh, remarkable. Yeah. Uh, Gordon, this is Henry, who lives in Knoxville, Tennessee, hasn't been able to breathe through both nostrils since he was 14. He learned to live with the condition for 60 plus years. Henry was wow. watching this program on November 12th of this year when he heard you say, someone has a crush injury to your 
nose. Your nose was broken but crushed in, and it's created airway problems, difficulty breathing for you, difficulty sleeping. God is healing all of that. He's restoring your airway now. By faith, Henry believed, and immediately he was able to breathe through both nostrils. Wow, that's amazing. Hallelujah. 60 years. Here's Patricia from Maryland. She was diagnosed a year ago with a degenerative eye disease. She became more and more fearful of losing her eyesight. On November 12th, that's this month, she heard Terry say, someone has been diagnosed with an eye condition that could lead to blindness. It has you so frightened. God is healing that condition for you. Slowly, it will simply go away. You will not have the condition anymore. You will not lose your eyesight. Well, Patricia received the word by faith and felt something like a film covering her eyes. Then her eyesight became clearer. When she went to her doctor, he confirmed the disease was not progressing and said it may not ever get worse. These are miracle reports, and you're, you're, you're hearing about miracles, someone that lived for 60 years without a proper airway, someone that had a degenerative eye disease diagnosed that could lead to blindness, someone that shouldn't have left the hospital, gets up off of a deathbed to declare, hello, it's Lazarus. Realize that in God's eyes, you're his child. You're his special one. We can all say when we you know, go to a, a Sunday school and you look at all the children. Well, there are a lot of children there. But when you see that it's your child in that Sunday school, well, then suddenly that place gets very special. You are God's child. He breathed you into being. You're infinitely wonderful to him. You're infinitely valuable to him. He thinks that you're worth it, that you're worth the sacrifice he made. He thinks that. And the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Who's that joy? Well, it's you. You being with him for all eternity. You being forgiven. You being set free. You being healed. That makes you unique. Makes you very special. Unique in all the universe. Take that. Realize you can go boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because you're the king's child. You get to go boldly to that throne. You get to ask, and then you get to receive. So let's do that. Here's the key to miracles. When you believe in your heart that you've already received, then you'll have it. These aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus. You can find them. In the Gospel of Mark, the 11th chapter, believe in your heart that you've already received and you will have it. That's pretty simple. When did your healing happen? Well, it happened 2,000 years ago. When were your sins forgiven? 2,000 years ago. It's already happened. Believe that. Believe it has already happened and you will have it. Let's pray. Let's believe. And let's let God do all the rest. Pray with us. Lord, we lift the needs of the audience to you. Anyone who is suffering in pain, anyone who has disease, anyone who has a bad diagnosis, we lift them all to you. And we declare these are your children, the sheep of your pasture. You caused them to be. You breathed life. They became living souls. They are part of you. And you died for them. And by, their, by your stripes, they are healed. They were healed. We receive it now. We receive every blessing that you have for us. Open the eyes of our understanding that we can perceive it, that we may know the greatness of your power towards us who believe. Stretch forth your hand now and do miracles, signs, and wonders, for we ask it in Jesus' name. There's someone you have a tremendous pain in your um, left knee, and it's primarily on the inside um, 
uh, and on, on the, the right side of the left knee. And God's, you just felt something like, like cold go through that joint. And it's just, you know, all that pain just left you now. It's a, a tremendous miracle. It's like a reconstruction miracle of the joint. God is healing everything concerning it. What you couldn't do before, do now. Get up on that knee. Realize it can hold your full weight. Everything is normal with it. Everything has been made whole in Jesus' name. Terry? Yeah, there's someone else. You have a condition. Um, it's with your mouth. It might also be with in the brain. I'm not sure. But you have a problem with lisping and also pronouncing words properly. God's healing that for you right now, though you've had this all of your life, you're being healed of it right now in Jesus' name. Receive that. Uh, there's someone else you, you've um, you've got seizures, and the the brain is just not firing correctly, and and random electrical discharges. God is is healing all of that for you. He's able to heal right down to the level of the neuron. He's able to to con control all of that and bring you back into self-awareness, self-control. You don't have to live in fear anymore. God is, is completely restoring, giving you back life. He came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Receive it yeah. now. And there are and many of you who have chronic illnesses, um, diseases that have been diagnosed. God is setting you free from those right now. Fibromyalgia, lupus, some of you diabetic. Just receive that healing. Put your hands up and begin to praise God and accept that today is your day of freedom in Jesus' name. There's someone you have a, a chronic weariness over you. And it's just, you know, you live, um, you're literally homebound. God, God is healing all of that. He's lifting depression off of you. He's giving you energy, new life, new outlook, uh, new things to do, a hope, a future. He's giving it all to you. He's pouring it out on you now abundantly. Receive it. Lift your hands to him. Begin to praise him for the new life that he's giving you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. You are the healer. You are the deliverer. You are our savior. You, you've rescued us from sin. You've res rescued us from everything. And you've restored us to your kingdom of light. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that doesn't give up, that says, I know God will answer. I know he's there. I know he's willing. I know I'm healed. All I have to do is get to him and I can get it. Uh, if that is the prayer you want to make, we're here for you. All you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Growing tensions between Taiwan and China. Taiwan's defense minister says it scrambled combat aircraft to confront 27 Chinese warplanes that entered its air defense buffer zone Sunday, as well as activating missile systems to monitor the planes, which included fighter jets and bombers. The incursion came as Chinese President Xi Jinping met with his military officers. In Russia, CBN continues to help children in unreached areas through Superbook. In the Omsk region near Siberia, the team has opened several Superbook clubs. Every week, children come to watch Superbook and learn from Superbook Academy while their parents attend church. One child named Eva gave her life to Jesus and is now serving at the club to help more children know about Jesus. The pastor shared, it is very joyful to see that this little girl is growing in God. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com international. Well, as we all know, the holiday season is upon us, and we want to be a part of your celebration. We've prepared special features just for you on CBNFamily.com, and these include recipes such as Gordon's Christmas Breakfast, 
Ashley's sugar cookies and my own hot fudge sauce. There's holiday music from For King and Country, Celtic Woman, Annie Moses Band, Point of Grace, The Singing Contractors, and more. Plus over a dozen holiday movies and special features, and it's all for free. You can join us at cbnfamily.com or by downloading the CBN Family app to your smart TV or device. Gordon? Well, Michael Holmes was down on his luck. He was unemployed, in debt, with no way to pay his rent. There was one thing Michael did have going for him. He had a dream. And here's how he made his dream come true. Michael Holmes' dream was to bring home a six-figure income. But in 2014, after losing his job, he was hoping for anything. Unemployed and in debt, Michael didn't know how he was going to support his family. The rent is due. The landlord needs the rent. He doesn't want to hear that you lost your job. It's kids who are looking up to you. So in my mind, frustration, um, aggravation, depression, all those different, and then of course the feeling of failure. Michael filed for unemployment. Though he was a Christian and volunteered at his church, he wondered why God was putting him through this. So here I am. Completely like just just broken nowhere to go nowhere to turn no money And I'm starting like to really ask God like shouting at God Angry at God like a little like a little five-year-old spoiled kid. Come on God. What's going on as opposed to Being in, more introspective and just really looking maybe there's something I'm doing wrong Michael decided to search the Bible for answers which he says he found in Malachi chapter 3 he talks about, you have robbed me of the tithes and offerings. Prove me now, the King James says, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive. Let me get this straight, me talking to God. I don't have any money. We have debts. The landlord wants to kick me out. And you want me to give money away. And I look in Malachi chapter three in the, in the New Living Translation, it says, try it, put me to the test. Michael tithed from his unemployment check. After a few weeks, he found a new sales job working as a renovation consultant. The money started coming in slowly, but Michael was growing impatient. But I'm like, all right, unemployment is almost about to run out. You said that you would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. I don't see any windows opening. And it got to the point where I was like, all right, I quit. I'm not doing this. I know I said I'm going to do it, and I quit. Michael went back to the Bible. He came across Acts chapter 5. And I believe it was Peter speaking to Ananias and Sapphira, and he said, you have withheld your, you have withheld your, your, your money in violation of your promise. The whole, the whole day just stopped. I felt embarrassed. I felt, I felt, I felt ashamed. I felt that, I said, I felt that, I said I wasn't going to do it again, and here I am doing it again. Michael decided to remain consistent with his tithing, and soon he started to see results. While the first year on the job he brought in less than $30,000, he had more than doubled that the next year. I think that if you can trust God with salvation and taking you to heaven and healing you, I think you should be able to trust him with your money. Within five years of tithing, Michael crossed the six-figure mark he had always dreamed about. Today. Michael is quick to tell people about the benefits of giving. In fact, he started a blog called tithehacker.org. He says without a doubt that God is faithful to those that trust him. There's so much that God wants to give every single one of his children. Doesn't matter male, female, black, white, um, denomination. But at the end of the day, there is a level of obedience that is necessary for him to do that. You know, so I think that if we would take him at his word, you know, and be faithful to what he's saying, he'll be faithful in doing what he promised. Listen to Michael's story. If you take God at his word and then act in accordance with his word and say, I'm going to do it your way. I'm, I'm tried my way, it didn't work out. Well, let's try God's way and see what happens. That's exactly what Michael did. And he said, okay, God says, prove me now in this. I'm going to prove, and, and I'll, I'll do this. I'll tithe. And then time goes by, and he forgets it. He forgets he's made the vow, and God comes back and reminds him. And in that reminder, he goes, okay, I'm finally all in. I, I want to do it your way. 
then he gets the breakthrough. Tithing is not some on-again, off-again thing. This isn't some heavenly lottery or heavenly slot machine where you put in the coin. It's not that way at all. It's when you say, God, I trust you with my salvation. I trust you with my internal soul. I trust you with everything, and I trust you with my finances, with my money. I'm going to put you first. That's when you really show, this is where my treasure is. This is where my heart is. If you want to start doing that, join the 700 Club. It's real easy. All you have to do is pick up the phone, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to become a member. How much is that? Well, it's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. We're going to take some email questions right now. Gordon, this first one comes from Clarissa, who says, I left religion altogether when my kids were young, and now I think I stunted their spiritual growth. My son is still searching, but my 28-year-old daughter has given up claiming she's agnostic with no interest in Christianity. I'm beginning to feel a disconnect with her that keeps me from even mothering her. I'm so lost and don't know where to turn. Any suggestions? Well, number one, don't get disconnected from your children, regardless of their belief systems or whether they're following um, Christianity uh, or not. Always remember, you're their one and only mother. They, they don't have um, plan B mother. They've got you. And what can you do? Well, number one, you can pray for them. And there's specific prayers you can, you can pray. You can pray the wonderful prayer from Jeremiah uh, to send messengers after God's own heart to them. If they're no longer receiving from you, ask God to show up with other messengers and ask God to show up directly. And he'll do that. So pray over your children. Keep praying for them and God will answer that prayer. Here's somebody, I'm gonna just condense this, wants to know, can we pray for our pets? Her dog has lipoma and they don't have money for a surgery. Yeah, uh, my father loves to tell the story of, there was, we had a dog and the dog was sick and, and so he just went over and lay hands on the dog and pray for the dog to get healed and the dog gave out a little yelp and was healed and, and looked at him funny, like what, what just happened? <laughs> So, yeah, God wants to perform miracles, uh, and that includes even your animals. Here's a word from Corinthians. Each of you should give what you have decided to in your heart, not reluctantly, for God loves a cheerful giver.